In this video, we're going to study the equations of motion applied to a continuum. One can think of the equations of motions as having two versions. The first version was developed by Newton, and then the second version was the extension by Euler. The version by Newton deals with the equilibrium of particles. If I have a group of particles, and they have forces between them, F1, F2, F3, F4, and so on, the equilibrium of each particle states that the sum of forces acting on that particle is equal to its mass multiplied by the acceleration of that particle. So for the figure in front of us, I can pick particle with mass M4, and I can analyze it under the action of the forces acting on it. The forces acting on the particle with mass m4 are f3, f4, f6, and f7. The horizontal component of these forces is equal to the mass of this particle multiplied by the horizontal component of the acceleration vector of that particle. So m4 multiplied by ax, which is the horizontal component of the acceleration, is equal to f3x plus f4x plus f6x plus f7x, which are the horizontal components of these forces. Similarly, m4ay, which is the mass multiplied by the vertical acceleration, is equal to the sum of the vertical components of these forces. Similarly, the mass multiplied by the z component of this acceleration is equal to the sum of the z components of the forces acting on that particle. These equations of motion applied to particles were developed by Sir Isaac Newton, who lived from 1642 to around 1726 or 1727, who is an English mathematician and physicist. Later, Leonard Euler was able to extend these equations to apply them to a continuum. The equations as developed by Sir Isaac Newton were used to explain the motion of the stars and the planets, including the repulsion and attraction forces between them. The extension of these equations to a continuum allow the study of the deformation of objects by studying the motion of the relative particles of a continuum with respect to each other. When we're studying the mechanics of a continuum, we're usually interested in the deformation of that continuum after applying external forces on that object. Euler basically stated that you can treat any part of a continuum as a particle and apply Newton's laws of equation onto that particle. So we're going to extract a very small cube and look at it under the microscope and see the forces that are acting on that cube. Since we studied already the Cauchy stress matrix, we know that on the face, with perpendicular vector E1, we have the traction vector TE1 with components sigma on 1, sigma on 2, and sigma on 3, and so on for the other faces perpendicular to the vector E2 and the vector E3. In order for us to develop the differential equations of equilibrium, we first have to assume that the stresses are smoothly distributed within the object. So for example, if I look at the relationship between sigma on 1 and x1, I will get a very smooth differentiable line that shows that sigma on 1 is smoothly distributed as a function of x1. And then I'm going to assume general value for the coordinate x1 and the value of the stress at that particular point is equal to sigma on 1 as a function of x1. After I traverse a small distance delta x1, then the value of the stress at this particular point is equal to sigma on 1 at x1 plus delta x1. The difference is delta sigma on 1, and this difference is obtained after traversing a distance delta x1. Because we're saying that the stress is smoothly distributed, I can use a Taylor approximation to approximate the value of sigma on 1 at x1 plus delta x1 as equal to sigma on 1 at x1 
plus the rate of change of sigma on one with respect to x1 multiplied by delta x1 plus other terms that I will ignore for now. Looking back under the microscope, I'm going to extract a cube of dimensions dx1, dx2, dx3, and I'm going to assume that it's a particle and I can apply Newton's laws of motion to that particle. And so this particle, I can assume that it's under a gravitational force with gravitational vector b with components b1, b2, and b3. And so the body forces or the gravitational forces acting on it has three components, rho b1, rho b2, and rho b3. The stresses acting on the back faces of the cube are sigma on 1, sigma on 2, sigma on 3, sigma to 1, sigma to 2, sigma to 3, and so on. On the front faces of the cube, there is a slight difference between the stresses there and the stresses on the back faces of the cube. For example, if this value is sigma on 1 acting on this back face of the cube, then this value on the front face of the cube is equal to sigma on 1 plus how much sigma on 1 changes with respect to x1 multiplied by dx1 because the distance from here to here is dx1. If this value is sigma on 2, then this value is also sigma on 2 plus a little bit more. This depends on how much sigma 1, 2 changes with respect to x1 multiplied by dx1. This is the distance dx1. Another example, if I look at the stress at the bottom face, sigma 2, 2, then the stress at the top face is equal to sigma 2, 2 plus a little bit more. This little bit more is equal to partial sigma 2, 2 by partial x2 multiplied by delta x2, which is the distance from here to here. I can now apply Newton's equations of motion to this cube, which I'm assuming to be a particle. The horizontal forces are sigma on 1 multiplied by the corresponding area, sigma 2 1 multiplied by the corresponding area, sigma 3 1 multiplied by the corresponding area, sigma on 1 plus partial sigma on 1 by partial x1 multiplied by dx1, then multiplied by the corresponding area, dx2, dx3. The other horizontal force is sigma 2 1 plus partial sigma 2 1 by partial x2 multiplied by dx2 this multiplied by the corresponding area and the last one is sigma 3 1 plus partial sigma 3 1 by partial x3 multiplied by dx3 all multiplied by the corresponding area plus the mass multiplied by the gravitational vector the horizontal component of the gravitational vector b1 this is equal to the mass multiplied by the horizontal acceleration of that cube. I can now replace the mass by the density multiplied by the volume. The density is rho and the volume is dx1 multiplied by dx2 multiplied by dx3. After replacing the mass with the density multiplied by the volume, I notice also that there are some components that can cancel each other. So for example, sigma on 1 multiplied by dx2 dx3 with a negative sign will cancel sigma on 1 multiplied by dx2 dx3 with a positive sign and so on this term will cancel this term and this term will cancel this term this is the equation that i'm left with after removing the terms that cancel each other notice that i can cancel dx1 dx2 dx3 from all the terms. So if you divide by dx1, dx2, dx3, you'll get this term. This part goes, this part goes, this part goes, this part goes, and this part goes. And so I will be left with the equation that states partial sigma on 1 by partial x1 plus partial sigma 2 1 by partial x2 plus partial sigma 3 1 by partial x3 plus rho b1 is equal to rho a1. If I repeat the same equation in the other two directions, I will get these other two equations. And so I have three equilibrium equations that I can derive using that differential volume. 
These three equations are sometimes written in a more compact form, where we say i could be 1, 2, or 3. When i is equal to 1, I get the first equation. When i is equal to 2, I get the second equation. And when i equal to 3, I get the third equation. And for every i, the equation is the sum from j equal 1 to 3, partial sigma j i by partial x j, plus rho b i is equal to rho a i. So try it out. If you put i is equal to 1, 2, and 3, and if you put this sum from j equal 1 to 3, you will get one of these three equations depending on what value for i you use. Another form of the equation, in a more compact form, this term is called the divergence of sigma, plus rho b is equal to rho a, so this is a vector form of the equation. The balance of angular momentum states that the rate of change of angular momentum of the particle is equal to the sum of moments of the forces acting on that particle. And when we apply this balance law to our cube, we get that the stress matrix has to be symmetric. Sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1. Sigma 1, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 1. And sigma 2, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 2. For static problems, the acceleration terms are replaced with zero. We also always assume that sigma 2, 1 is equal to sigma 1, 2. Sigma 3, 1 is equal to sigma 1, 3. Sigma 3, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 3 to satisfy the equations of balance of angular momentum. And so the problem in continuum mechanics usually is given an object with a reference configuration omega naught, we wish to find the deformed configuration and the stresses acting on that deformed configuration. The stresses should satisfy those three equations of equilibrium. The object sometimes is under the effect of a gravity force vector or a body force vector B in R3. The boundary conditions for these differential equations are given in two forms. One is the stresses or the traction vector sigma transpose n on part of the boundary. The other is the displacement on another part of the boundary. There are two major problems associated with the differential equations of equilibrium as we develop them. The first problem is that we have three equations, yet six unknowns. And so if we want to solve these differential equations to find the stresses, we have to impose some restrictions to be able to find only three stresses out of these six equations. The other problem is that the displacement appears as a boundary condition, but yet does not appear in the differential equation itself. And so I need to be able to incorporate the boundary condition of displacement in these equations. We are going to do so in the future by using a constitutive law, which allows us to replace the stresses with the strains, and the strains being functions of the displacement, we are able to use those differential equations in terms of the displacement u1, u2, and u3. So then I would have three unknowns that I can use those equations to find. However, in the meantime, we will present a few examples in the lectures that show how to solve these equations for very particular examples.